Hello everyone and welcome to the Autodesk Robot Structural Analysis Tutorial brought to you by the Civil Engineering Essentials channel. I hope you enjoy the video. So in this video we are going to continue our task in modeling the bridges uh, as we have planned before. At least the concrete bridges, I will still have the steel bridge in on my radar. Maybe it needs a different uh, project itself because it seems that we are going through a really deep rabbit hole here. So first things first, I want to address some uh, comments I had in the comment section. So to do that, I'll basically select this and uh, Yeah, that's baby C in the record and go to edit move or copy and copy me that thing and Execute this and basically close it. All right, so uh, There was a comment in which it really intrigued me. The idea was that if you select and replace once again the uh, supports by rollers it seems that there will not be any instability issues. So let's try that. Yeah, let's put some pins here. And let's run the analysis, basically. All right, so worryingly, there is no instability, as our dear subscriber Donald Khania has mentioned. As he's explained, that if you do remove the offset, like if you say no offset at all, it seems that things get back to normal. Let's try that. So let's hit the apply button. Yes. Let's run the analysis now. Now, according to his uh, comment, there should be instability. So let's take a look. Indeed, there are instabilities. So what gives? A good thing that he mentioned is that it gets much smoother when you have no offsets. That's the first thing that he noticed. This seems to be even, in my own opinion, even more representative to what the analysis of those uh, bridges uh, includes. Usually when you analyze a bridge, you're assuming that each span, if you assume simply supported, you assume a WL square over 8, um, uh, moment, which is what you see here, and uh, here it seems to be different, although those two bridges are copy pastes of each other, there seems to be some jagged stuff happening here for this beam, whereas this beam has no problem. So of course this immediately like raises the question, what gives, what's the idea? Uh, turns out the idea is that uh, this little jumpy things in the moment diagram is due to the offsets themselves. Now what are those offsets? In an offset video I have done before, I tried to make the offset by making a member that has infinite stiffness. I'll select the bar with its nodes, and I have to select the beginning and end nodes. And now that I have selected the nodes, I will have to move or copy it, and I'll copy it half height up. So I click copy, removing the story filter, I have my copy. Now I forgot to drag, so I have to manually do this. This is again a repetition of a part of my offset video. Go check it out for more context. All right, so I just offset it and draw, draw all those lines. And now I have to delete the uh, original line. So let's delete that. And now we are ready to analyze. Now, of course, this is not perfect because offsets are done by rigid links, which are things that have infinite stiffness. The structure became stable, and I have a theory behind that. Previously, when there was no offset, the structure became unstable. Now, with offsets, the structure became stable. This is courtesy of our dear subscriber Donald Khanie, who gave me this food for thought. So, if I open the moment diagram, you see this ragged, dashed moment diagram, this discontinued moment diagram, whereas this one is a clean cut moment diagram. So, what gives? It seems that the offsets, it seems that the offsets do affect something. Now, of course, it wouldn't be a CE video if it doesn't just tell you why or just gives you a theory behind how. I would suggest that offsets not be used in bridges. This is a revelation I got from our dear subscriber, Donald Khani. So I would really, really, really thank him from the bottom of my heart. Against all odds, would now suggest not to offset your beam. Even if it's offset in reality, do not offset it in, uh, in the model. The reason why you should not offset your beam is because there is no offset for the plate. Those shells cannot be offset. So what ends up happening in robot's brain is this, this model where you have a beam that is offsetted, connected with a, a big amount of little bars here that have infinite stiffness. Now, why do you have uh, these jagged lines of uh, moment? The reason why you have those jagged lines of moment is because those bars will carry some moment themselves. Allow me to explain this. Select here, um, XZ, and then go to Y equals zero. And let's normalize the, bar, the diagram. Now the reason, the reason why you see a jagged line of moment diagram when you do the offset is, is because the offset is done using frame elements here. This is why it also got stabilized. This is high level stuff and I 
might even video edit this to the end of the video, uh, those columns that were generated from the offsets are what carry moment to, and there is no way to uncarry the moment here. This is how robot does it. This is internally done. Which means this moment that is being carried by those little sticks or elements is what causes this continuity in the moment diagram and causes a smaller moment in the girder than it actually is. Because look, you cannot see the columns here, this little columns, but this is what happens when you do an offset. This is what happens behind the scenes. So this little thing and the comment of our dear subscriber Donald Khani immediately uh, puts my plans onto halt and tells me to remove all offsets and actually uh, like makes me really worried because this means that Autodesk should improve their offsets. What I suggest Autodesk do as a scientist is when you offset a bar that is pinned in both end on both ends, then the offset should be only a truss element without carrying any moments. Now this is not happening here in the offset system currently applied. I suggest that Autodesk implements this. If you have a bar that has two end released, then you should also release all offsets. Allow me to demonstrate this. So I will do now the unthinkable. I hope I can do this. So I'll select all those little links I created and I will go release them. I have no idea if it will work or not, to be honest. I have zero idea. So let's just go to geometry. I just want, I'm just following a little unhinged thinking here. So let's go to releases. So I released, I think I over released, right? I don't know, just a test. So I released all those offsets. Let's run the analysis. I'm predicting instabilities now. Please give me instability. Yes, no? Yeah, there we go. See, it's unstable now. And also, see, you get the perfect clean moment diagram. So, as ridiculous as it sounds, offsetting here is not the way to go. Another revelation I just got here is offsetting when you have a shell above your beam is also not the way to go because it gives you some crazy moments here that are due to the links here. You see, this is why I love comments from our dear subscribers because they help this channel get better and better. You see, uh, the idea is that this is a community because whatever comment you give me is something I will try to introduce next video and we will all learn something new. So yeah, it seems that Autodesk Robert's offset system has a small malfunction that it doesn't work perfectly when you have a shell because of the uh, proof I just proven to you basic. Kudos to our subscribers and uh, I guess kudos to me. But uh, the idea is that this should be improved in Autodesk Robot. Anyway, with this revelation out of the way, I will now remove all offsets. Now, does this have a consequence on the model? Yes, it does. Allow me to remind you. There are two ways of making a bridge. If you have this deck slab, then the load path is from the deck slab to the beam and from the beam to the pier. The deck slab and the pier do not see each other. The pier doesn't feel the deck slab directly. The deck slab is not resting on the pier. Whereas here, the deck slab is resting on the beams in the span and resting on the piers directly when it's above the pier. So the problem that we have here is that we, first of all, we don't need offsets. But even if we do not have offsets, we still have to address this. We still have to address both options here. So first of all, let's do the easy one. This option is the easier one. I'm going to remove the offsets because of mathematical problems within the finite element of robot. Remove all offsets. Our bridges seem to be perfectly fine. Now, now removing the uh, offset, change the moment value here. It seems the moment value here is higher than its cladding counterpart. The reason behind this is because of self-weights, I believe. I think we're doing great so far. Let me just copy this because I want to have a continuous bridge too. Basically, edit, edit move or copy. I forgot the distance, so I'll use my AutoCAD skills and select from here to here to create the same distance. Basically, uh, releases and remove all releases here. I think my cube is smaller. And let's also remove the panel releases. So geometry, properties, additional attributes. Yeah, there we go. Linear releases. Okay. Now this is a continuous frame. The instability is from this structure, I have told you why. If you go to uh, ma results, maps, and select uh, MY, for example, and go to panel cut if you want. So let's go to results, panel cuts. 
and I just want to show something really nice. So let's cut parallel to x. Let's make a new cut and cut parallel to xz in this point. So let's select this point, click here, apply, and now I have a panel cut. It seems that it's exactly as I want. It's a continuous slab and a continuous beam because if you go to results, diagrams and members, and why apply, you see the continuous beam diagram as it should be. So everything seems to be seems to be nice and dandy, but there is one problem. You see, the problem is in this scenario, you are assuming also not only look, this is very important now. Look, uh, I don't have my drawing pad with me, otherwise I would have drawn in 3D to under, for you to understand. But this is your pier, and you are connecting the girders into the pier. Now, the connection between the girder and the pier, if it's a rigid connection, you don't need a release. If it's a released connection, you have to make a release. But that not, that's not all, because you also have the connection between the deck slab and the pier. And as far as I know, deck slabs are not connected to the piers via moment resistance connections, as far as I know. So you might need to release the pier from the deck slab. You might need to do that. So those are a lot of things. And see, like there is no singular, perfect bridge model that I can tell you. The only thing I can tell you is that, hey, those things exist. Whatever you do, whatever you assume, is what you will have to stick with. So I will assume now that the, the pier here is not connected at all to the, sub, to the superstructure here. <clears throat> so I will limit myself to this one because this is the most bridge I most see, uh, what I will limit myself to, and all discussions from here on are going to be about this. So uh, the connection for this between the pier and the beams, as well as the pier and the deck slab, are released. But uh, the connection between... I just did a tons of a ton of uh, tests and trials off camera and nothing is even close to giving me what I want. You see what I want is to have the beams continuous and the deck slab continuous but the connection between the entire superstructure the entire uh, deck slab beam assembly and the pier as well as all the piers to be uh, released. Now I tried doing this additional attributes and go to linear releases and let's release that thing so let's release it from here I'm selecting the peers now I think this will work let me just check if I run the analysis now yeah I think yeah I think it did work to recap what do we have now we have a simply supported bridge two spans a single continuous bridge uh, in shell mode and another continuous bridge in uh, cladding mode and I have a continuous bridge, multi-span. The only thing I don't have is one span, simply supported bridge. But of course, if you know how to do two spans, you can do one span yourself. All right. I need, of course, to analyze the structure now and provide some uh, helping structures to it. So I will draw me two helping structures just, just to show you. So I think, I think this served its purpose. I think this has served its purpose. So... I wanted to keep it, but I will delete it because this instability thing will drive me crazy. And I don't want to mess up and assume something stable, whereas it isn't, so I have to delete this. Yeah, now it's stable. Okay. All right, so let's do our supporting structure here. Now, how would I do my supporting structure? Well, it's basically an elevator shaft that is around a... that is surrounded by a staircase. So I will not be an architect planning here, of course not. But at least I should give the viewer an idea of how those things look. Now, uh, I will assume that my room is... Uh, okay, uh, there, is, there was a video about staircases. It was about st circular staircases, but the same rules apply. I basically make the elevator 1.5 by 1.5, because it needs to be larger. And uh, <clears throat> those pedestals are 1 by 1. So 1.5 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3.5 and the other direction is 3.52 so 0 1 2.5 3.5 and 0 1 2. I need to delete everything by the way 
0, 1, 2.5, and 3. And in Z, um, I will make, I tried in my hour here, uh, I will make four flights, not three. 0, 0.75, um, 1.5, 2.25, 3, and then 3.75, 4.5, and 5.25, and 6. Also in Z, I added a story because the elevator needs to reach that level. So yeah, that's that. Uh, if you hit apply now, you see that it's not exactly um, symmetric with the bridge structure. I think that's okay. It doesn't matter, to be honest. But you can make it symmetric by shifting this down, uh, going here. Shifting it relative to the point, now it was 0.5, so 0.75 should be the one that makes it become symmetric, I think. Yeah, there we go. All right, so if you're a symmetric lover, then please be my guest. All right, so fantastic. Now let's do our model here. So I go to my column, I define the 300 by 300 column. It's 9 meters up in Z. And, well, let's start clicking. One, wait, no, 9 meters beginning so one two three four the reason why I spaced 40 centimeters is because I didn't want to have an overlap between the column and the pier in the foundation domain the column and the pier foundations would overlap however the pier foundation is deeper than the column foundation so maybe you can let this pass alternatively you can have one single foundation for both I don't like that because we have a structural um, joint here. So what you should end up doing is maybe think about having one little raft foundation below everything or shift your columns even further away. Instead of 9.4 here uh, is to shift it even further away. Now I'm not going to do this. I will leave it at the discretion of my engineer because remember this is a bridge video but we are doing other things besides that just to make it a wholesome bridge video. For my um, elevator I will keep it thickness 300. I'll be talking about some ideas of modeling elevators later uh, because for example now I know the mechanical engineers are now screaming foul here uh, the reason why is because uh, you see I am disregarding the need for a maintenance shaft below or above the uh, elevator I'm just I'm just modeling the elevator walls now from the right side one two three so one two three I'm gonna make it clockwise now uh, there is always an ongoing discussion between should the uh, staircase sh should the staircase be clockwise or anti-clockwise. I have no inputs on this, so please tell me in the comment section what you think. I just realized that the thickness used in those plates are thickness 300, and I'm now while I'm video editing. I'm modifying those to be thickness 200 because it's a staircase. It took me a lot of time to be honest to do this. Um, but I think we are getting somewhere. So, what I have done while video editing was I created a structure like this. This is the uh, service structure to the bridge. And the service structure is consisted of four columns, as you can see, a elevator shaft in the center. Of course, the elevator shaft has openings here to fit the elevator. Those were not modeled in this uh, model, to be honest and usually are actually done on site by providing some reinforcement around the opening. One rule of thumb I have for openings in shear walls is if the opening is small enough and the forces are not large enough, you can basically uh, shift whatever reinforcement was cut and put it on the edges of the uh, elevator opening. For example, let's say that you make an opening here and this opening, when you open it, breaks one, two, three, four beam, uh, bars. Then you simply provide two uh, vertical bars here and two vertical bars here. Also, if it cuts five bars horizontally, then you provide five bars on top of it. Now, uh, the planning of the structure is as follows. The guy enters from here, has two options, or he can also enter from here, has two options. He can enter the elevator directly or turn around the staircase, loop the loop, until it reaches the last floor. This happens on both sides, so that's that. Now for the staircase themselves, uh, the flights are supported by the two ends here, and the ends need to be supported. Now it's not wise to support the ends on the edge of a column alone, so usually you have those edge beams that help support those plates or slabs that in turn, the slabs in turn, support the flights. 
So that's why you see some nice cool beams there. Um, with that being said, another option for letting people go up and down is to provide a structure like this with some flights and some spaces to have pause in between. This is not user friendly because you might have people who are unable to uh, climb those steps and would have a problem. You could provide an elevator here if you want, but this would be a little bit neater. I don't know. Uh, those two options are there. It depends on your planning uh, purposes and the budget or budget you have for the project. So I think we covered most of the things you want to talk about uh, in uh, the modeling section. We still haven't touched on uh, we still haven't touched on loads, but here is a thought for you for the loads. I want to talk about the loads next time because believe it or not, this video might be 20 minutes long. I have no idea what the editor will do with it. But it took me far more than I want to. You know what? I will admit it took me around 2.5 hours because uh, because of all the offset ideas and investigations that I have to do uh, behind the scenes. So uh, yeah, I will leave the loading for later. However, the thing I, I will upload this. Uh, there's two things I will do. First of all, I run the analysis to make sure nothing is unstable because if something is unstable, then yeah, there is a warning here. It seems. Okay, separate structure, that's okay. Uh, an element is not assigned to any story, that's perfectly fine. The reason why we have this is because this seems to be not assigned to any story. Well, that's okay, we don't care about this. This is not a big, not a big issue. Uh, it seems everything is being analyzed perfectly. Uh, two things remain to be addressed. The first thing is uh, that I said that the Gerda carries the DEX lab. Now the problem here is that indeed the Gerda carries the DEX lab, but when the DEX lab reaches the pier, the DEX lab rests on both the pier and the beam. This is something I will do for later. I will think about a way of dealing with this and uh, uh, modeling this later. The second thing that remains is to create an influence line, meaning I need to have a moving load. Now, I will just give you an introduction to this because I will talk about this later. But I want to give you a small introduction to how you do moving loads. Let's say you want to do a moving load on the beam. Notice the beam is what needs to be analyzed under moving load, not the DEX lab. Because the DEX lab, yes, you can have moving load, but in the end, it's not spanning long enough for it to have any difference. As a matter of fact, you can just put the full loading of live, live load and dead load and would be perfectly fine. What gets affected, however, is of course the beam that is uh, being loaded by the live load that can move, especially if the beam is continuous like this one. So it needs to be considered, and I'm only going to show you one little trick how I will do moving loads because I will deal with it next time, but just to give you food for thought. If you go to loads and go to <clears throat> special loads, you have something called moving loads. Now, in the moving loads, you can create all kinds of loads you want. Now, here there is the H15 and HS15 to 14. Those are predefined loads. And the reason why they are there is because when you go to your preferences in the databases, you have a vehicle load, and it's according to Ashtor. Of course, you can change it if you're a British standard guy. So uh, those trucks are what came uh, preset in robot. Of course, you can create any load you want with any a possibility you load. For me, I'll just show you a very simple trick now. I'll just do here and say here. Uh, I'm just going to call it new here and say here my point load just to show you how this thing works. Of course, there is more <coughs> uh, behind the scenes here. I'll just say my moving load now. And I will make it a nodal load, just a concentrated load, just a point load. The load value is, I don't know, one, a unit load. Uh, you can, of course, change it. I will make a unit load now. And it has no database, of course. I can save it to a database, but it shouldn't. So I have now a force, which is a unit. I add that and close it, and I have my point load. How do you apply a moving load? Well, first of all, uh, you click on the load and it has a specific case, so you can call it, for example, moving load. This is the case name that will be generated. Then you have a route for the moving load. Where, want to, where do you want the load to move? So basically, to define a route, 
you will have to define it using the define button. If you click on define, you can define a polyline, a line, and a contour. For me, I will define a line from here to here, basically. Yes. So I defined my route. You can see it's got a number here. If you close, this is the step size of the load moving, and this is the load direction. Uh, zero means zero and x. Because look, the value is 1, right? But is it an x? Is it an y? Is it an z? You see, this is the magnitude of the force, and those are the direction cosines. You learn from statics that you multiply the, direct, uh, the magnitude by the uh, cosines here. And by the way, those don't follow the direction cosines because you could have 10 here and 5 here and negative 1 here, to be honest. This would mean that the point load has 10 in x, 5 in y, and negative 1 in z. For me, it's just a point load downwards, so it has a negative 1 in Z, and that is it. The step size I will leave for 1, but you can make it finer. If you apply this and close, then you can see that you have a case called moving load. And suddenly, for this case, you have a slider that doesn't work yet, so let's run the analysis. When the analysis is complete, you have two envelopes, and suddenly in the moving load, you have a slider. So what does it mean? Well, let's take a look. Let's go to our diagrams. This is something I will do next time in detail. Please notice for the new viewers here that this is a continuation of a video series regarding bridges. So I just increased this, the diagram size, of course, I need to increase it significantly because the load is small. And you can see that, well, the moving load is somewhere here. Now it's continuous, so you see all kinds of crazy stuff. The moving load is here, and if, it, if you move it, you can see the moment, wait, what? Let me normalize this. When you move it, you can see, now a good way of normalizing this is to go to the envelope and normalize the envelope itself, and then it normalizes everything. So let's go back to the moving load. So you can see that when you move up and down in the cases, the moment diagram moves, as you can see. This is something I have explained, you can see, this is something I have explained in the first video for this series uh, about uh, bridges. Take a look on that, it's gonna be linked above. Let me just make it a little bit cool so that you can see it because it's invisible now. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> so while you are moving, you see you have negative moment, and suddenly the car is now here and vice versa happens. If you go to the envelope, you can see the envelope happening here, and you can see that some points do have negative and positive moments at the same time, which will cause fatigue. Now, this is a one kilonewton force, and this envelope needs to be done for the full live load, and there is more to it, because maybe you have two live loads, three live loads, there is a lot more from where that came from. So it needs a separate video. However, what I'm trying to say is, when you finish your envelope, then you can design your beam, because your envelope will be your live load and your dead load as well, your dead load, and then you can design your beam. I'm talking about uh, reinforced concrete, not pre-stressed. Maybe later I will talk about pre-stressed concrete when we talk about highways. Maybe. So uh, you have an animation that animates this for you, but wait, where is the load? Right? Like, what gives? Where is the load? This is a moving load, right? So I should be seeing a load. I don't see the load. I mean, I can deduce that the load is here, but I still don't understand where the load is. Also, notice the cool thing. If one beam gets loaded, the other beam feels the load too because they are connected by a slab, which totally makes sense. So, where is the load, right? Well, right-click, go to display, go to loads, and there is something called forces generated automatically. If you click that with what? Ah, oh, there we go. If you click on forces or loads generate automatically and show the loads actually, or load symbols, then you can see the load. And you can see the load moving on the bridge. Of course, a cool touch in robot is to basically make an animation of this. This is why we love robot because animations do make sense to us when we see them. So I just increase the scale a little bit and animate that thing. So let's go to animation. It's really cool. And let's just start the animation. So you can see it's now animating the bridge under the load. It's moving. It's perfect. Nothing to be mentioned here. So yeah, of course, the uh, scales are exaggerated here. So yeah, that's... Uh,
that's how you would model a life load. Of course, there is more to it, but this is just a small introduction to the topic. Because I want to give you something to think about for the next, until I give you the next video. For the next video, what we still have to do is, one, we have to understand and find a way to separate the DEX lab from the peer. Now, truth to be said, if we don't separate it, it's not a big deal, to be honest. It will be affected, it will affect the deflections here, and maybe the reinforcement of the DEX lab here, but it doesn't matter because the lateral reinforcement is critical here, not near the peer. So this is all good. Still, if I find a way to separate the... Um, wait, this mesh is ugly. Yeah, anyway, I'll get back to it later. Uh, if I find a way to separate the DEX lab from the peer, it will be perfect. This is the first thing I will have to do. The second thing we have to do is to dive deeper into the loading here for the live load because you could have not just one person, you could have groups of people, you could have the whole beam, the whole bridge loaded. So we need to take into account multiple scenarios for the loads. To be honest, the scenarios are infinite, so you have to basically cover some logical number of scenarios to be dealt with. The third thing we have to do is to uh, calculate or approximate the dead loads on the bridge. Of course, what about those things? Those things are not part of the scope of this uh, modeling session. And then finally, and I think the finally needs a separate video, finally we might start uh, basically designing those beams and bridges and columns, of course. So yeah, that is the plan, basically. And we'll do this next time. Um, now, before I sign off, there is a huge, like, bridge-sized shout-out to also my other dear subscriber, who is near Sapai. And he mentioned, and we will talk about this next time because I still haven't investigated it, he talked about lateral bracing. Now, what does this mean? Um, and that's why, once again, I want to repeat my shout-outs to my dear subscribers who ask amazing questions that help me and them uh, and all of yours uh, dive deeper into those topics. This is why it's not just, uh, it's not just me lecturing. You. No, no, no. It's a community. We basically give ideas to each other. So uh, the second uh, point that was raised before I sign off, and I want to mention it here because I still have no, I'm not ready to answer it yet, was about the need for lateral bracing for the beams. Now, why was this mentioned? Mentioned by our dear subscriber, Yasapai, he mentions that we need lateral bracing for beams, which makes sense, but why do we need this? This is a very long story, and I will try to make it as simple as possible. You see, there is something called lateral torsional buckling. It's in steel, but it's also in concrete. The, at least, let's say lateral buckling now, without torsional. You see, when you have moments applied on a section, parts of the section are under compression, and parts of the section are under tension. And the, let's say, half. The half that is under compression might actually uh, buckle. And you would have an out-of-plane buckling. Like, if this beam looks like this, it could buckle not up and down, but left and right. Like try, take your plastic ruler, I mean, almost all of us have a plastic ruler, right? You have this plastic, you have this plastic ruler that looks like this, which is a uh, very small thickness on one side, okay? And try bend it. If you bend it strong enough, it will not bend up and down, but rather it will bend sideways. It's a really cool thing, and they wanted to try this at home, of course, uh, don't hurt yourself, don't break your ruler. But if you try to bend it hard enough and just nudge it sideways, a small nudge, then it will buckle sideways. And this is why we need lateral bracings for beams, especially when they are big, because, uh, because the compression zone is usually big for those big beams and has huge values and forces. So... That's a good idea, and his suggestion is actually to brace the beam at certain intervals, like one meter, two meter, three meter, and so on. Why do we brace them? Because we want to stop the lateral movement, which is a good idea. Now, I am not sure, because I have a counter-argument to this, but I'm not sure. I have, to, I have to check it out myself. You see, my point of view, which might be wrong here, this is only a point of view now, I have to investigate it, because it's relative now, 
my point of view is because you are casting uh, the girders, like at least this is how I would do it. I would cast the girder and connect the deck to the girder almost monolithically. So I would have some studs that connect shear connectors or the stirrup go all the way up like this. I will try to connect the girder to the deck slab or even cast it monolithically if I can. And it's not, it's not that I'm arguing against our dear subscriber's uh, comment. On the contrary, I'm just giving myself food of thought here. My argument is that maybe, just maybe, the deck slab is strong enough to provide lateral uh, bracing to that beam. Now, is this the case? I have no idea because it's relative. If you have big beams, then no matter what happens to your deck slab, it's not strong enough to hold your beams. Also, if your connection is weak, then it's also not strong enough to hold your beams. And this is the uh, position of our dear subscriber in Yusepai, which I totally respect. I'm really happy that he asked this question. I need to dive deeper into it. I'm pretty sure that there is some sort of code recommendation as to when to apply lateral bracing for the beams. I, would, I still don't have a clear answer for you here, so I will leave it for next time. This basically brings me to the end of this video. I hope that you've enjoyed the video and that was beneficial for you. Of course, if you have enjoyed the video, then please leave a like, share, comment, subscribe, and the liking, especially subscribing, because it helps increase the reach of my channel. Uh, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we'll catch you in the next video.